So um, a session begins to come to an end, and um, a marking of Rohatsu for this year uh, with it. Uh, marking the passing, uh, well, we passed past the eighth, but marking the enlightenment of, uh, of Shakyamuni Buddha over two and a half thousand years ago. And the way that flame has lit many generations of lives um, along the way and has been passed down through many, many generations to us here, all of us here together on session. So um, I'd like to pay tribute and thanks, express my gratitude to my teacher, Taigu, uh, who passed it to me from his teacher, Trodo Cross, and from his teacher, Nishijima Roshi, who started our, our lineage. So deep words of thanks to them. Um, yes, these teachings are yours. They've been given to you. Now you have them. Preserve them well. I just want to um, look at the uh, some of the, the the earliest accounts of Shakyamuni's uh, awakening from the Pali Canon, um, and this wonderful translation work has been done by Bhikkhu Bodhi, um, and the foreword here is by the Dalai Lama, who uh, uh, Desmond and William, you know, who were serving us during Orioki, they're going to India on Tuesday for two or three weeks of teachings by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So uh, with the Rinpoche who's based over in the main house there. Um, so the Pali Canon, the, the earliest, it is the earliest account we have of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, the Buddha taught for 40 odd years. Uh, he died at around the age of 80. Um, he taught for in excess of 40 years and according to the tradition Ananda his closest attendant <coughs> remembered everything Ananda was famous for his memory and um, even though Mahakashyapa was the first um, <coughs> transmission of the teaching he was the first to receive the transmission Famously, Mahakashyapa and Buddha, it's the flower sermon, the wordless sermon of the Buddha, when Mahakashyapa is sitting with everyone else, and the Buddha picks up a flower and says nothing, he just holds up a flower. And only Mahakashyapa smiles, and like Ronan here smiling now. And he didn't laugh though. <laughs> anyway, uh, only Mahakashyapa smiles. Um, is there a flower there behind you, uh, Kayla? I think you picked one yesterday. Can you give it to me, if you don't mind? Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, so the Buddha just picks up a flower and holds it. Mahakashyapa smiles and no one else smiles and that's the teaching that's the transmission so what was transmitted and what was taught okay so that's one for you to to sit with <laughs> you know in our keto ceremony last night the flower was one of the gestures you know
So, um, that's the wordless sermon of Shekhi Uri Buddha in the Flower Sermon. And that's the beginning of the transmission of the Zen lineage through 93 generations to, to us here, to all of us. Um, but there were sermons with words and the sutras that we had were memorized, as I said, by Ananda. And after the, the Buddha died, um, the, his followers came together uh, to go through and to recite the teachings, the sutras, and to sh share them in their memories uh, and divide them up. Uh, the first council. And um, Ananda, who carried all this in his mind, um, hadn't yet awakened. And Mahakashapa didn't want to invite him to the, <laughs> to the council because it was only for awakened uh, uh, arhats, awakened beings. But luckily, Ananda woke up the night before. <laughs> Uh, he had his awakening the night before. Really what this is, is probably like any, like any follower, like any teacher, their followers split, you know? And this is really the potential first split of Buddhism between Mahakashyapa and, An and Ananda. Uh, Mahakashyapa was a, was a Brahmin. He was a, he was a kind of nobility, really. And Ananda was, wasn't. In an Indian society, that meant something. But of course, the Buddha rejected the caste system, you know, rejected all these kind of um, ways of dividing up society. So anyway, uh, Ananda was, was invited, and the teachings were recited. And they were recited over generations, and a couple of centuries later, they were written down. And that's what we have. And the Pali Canon is not something that it's not something that um, the Mahayana draw on very much. Um, the Theravadan schools tend to, in fact, not tend to, put it absolutely central centrally to their uh, teachings because they've guarded, thanks to them, they have guarded these sutras and have passed them from generation to generation. They were written first on leaves, you know, leaves of trees. Um, so, the Mahayana tends to uh, focus a lot on its own later sutras, and we very rarely go back and look at the Pali Canon, but I thought, because it's Rahatsu, we should uh, have a look at the, the earliest account. So the Buddha had left home, Prince Siddhartha, and left his life of luxury and privilege, like we all have, um, because we live here in the first world. We don't, we don't go hungry, even though my stomach was making terrible sounds this morning. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> I think the whole room could hear it. I was thinking, my Dharma name is Miozan Kodo, Wondrous Mountain, and <coughs> if they heard me, they would have called me Hungry Stomach instead. So. <laughs> or Noisy Stomach. Thunder Stomach. Anyway, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so... Uh, what was my point? Yeah. Was, oh yes. So thank you. So yeah. So we um, so we never go hungry, uh, and we have this life of privilege in the way that Shakyamuni does. So in many ways, Shakyamuni is a perfect teacher for us. You know. Um, so he leaves his life of privilege, and he he goes out. He leaves his life of privilege because, as we were looking at yesterday, he encountered old age, sickness, and death. And he wanted to find a way to end suffering. This was his quest. He practiced with many teachers. He spent 
years of practice. Uh, practiced great austerities where he starved himself, uh, living on almost nothing, getting cl very close to death. Uh, as the ascetics of India uh, practiced. He learned yoga and many meditation techniques, but none of them seemed to fulfill his goal of ending suffering. And at, he was very close to death, really, because he'd, he'd um, practiced such severe austerities. Uh, and then he decided to go and take some food. Uh, a girl, very kindly, a woman, offered him some food, some rice porridge and milk. And this gave him back strength. And he, he was frowned on by the people he'd been practicing with, who had practiced for taking food and breaking his fast. So he followed the middle way. This is the beginning of... of, of you know, the middle way. And he went and sat uh, under uh, the, the tree. And how long he sat for, the accounts varied. And then he had this great awakening. So let's, let's see what the Pali Canon says. But by this raking, and this is, these are the words of the Buddha as recounted. Uh, these are the words of Shakyamuni Buddha himself from two and a half thousand years ago has passed to Ananda and onwards, finally into the written word. But this raking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Could there be another path to enlightenment? So by practicing his austerities, he had not found his path to enlightenment. Then he has this wonderful memory of when he was a child. I considered, I recall when my father, the Shakyan, was occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of, of a rose apple tree, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered and dwelled in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. Could this be the path to enlightenment? Then. Following on that memory came, that, came the realization, this is indeed the path to enlightenment. Shakyamuni is remembering a moment from childhood when he felt this happiness and bliss coming from seclusion, when he's sitting in a rose bush. Um, a rose apple tree, excuse me. Uh, sitting beside in the shade of a, of, a, of a rose apple tree in seclusion when his father's working. And this, this state comes upon him, this state of absorption, this first jhana, which is marked by bliss and happiness. Traditionally, there are eight jhanas. I thought, why am I afraid of that happiness? that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. I thought, I am not afraid of that happiness. That has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. I'm going to not read it all. And I ate some solid food. When I ate the boiled rice and porridge, the five monks were disgusted. So we have the kind of puritanical view of practice you know, uh, breaking rules, you know. Um, so Shakyamuni here is, is, is breaking ranks, breaking rules, and is frowned on by the, his Puritan um, uh, friends. With the subsiding of knowledge and examination, I entered and dwelled in the second jhana, which has internal confidence and, un and unification of mind, is without thought and examination and has rapture and happiness born of contemplation. The third jhana, equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. The path 
passing away of joy and displeasure, even beyond joy, beyond that. The fourth jhana is neither painful nor pleasant. Perfect equanimity. Everything in its right place. Now we're moving towards freedom from suffering, where even pleasure and pain are moved beyond. And here I directed it to the knowledge to the to, to the recollection of, of past lives. A hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. Fascinating this, considering physics, science, the Big Bang, the explosion, the contraction. So the, the, the Buddhist view of the cosmos, the cosmological view of Buddhism is absolutely beyond matter. It is staggeringly vast. It is beyond this universe. They talk about many universes, many worlds, an infinite amount of universes, an infinite amount of Buddha fields with one Buddha within each. So it's almost like different dimensions, you know, or uh, contractions and expansions, you know. Any uh, scientists here? You're one, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the Big Bang not being the beginning. No. Yeah, I mean, it was, you must have new theories now, but uh, we were discussing this yesterday about Harriman who invented the, the sheer amount of it. Mm. So, and one, you know, William certainly knew one, and most of them must believe, but then there's another one where everybody just says, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And yeah. So this is, I mean, if you want to have your mind blown, blown in that way, read the Lotus Sutra <coughs> as well. Mm. The Lotus Sutra is full of these, you know, infinite amounts of universes and, uh, and dimensions and Buddha worlds, and it's staggering. And now scientists have, are talking like that. <laughs> so a uh, hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion. The first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose. He remembers all his, um, his previous lives. You know, the, what are they called? The Jakarta Tales, I think. Yeah, is it the Jakarta Tales? I think so. Yeah, which are the accounts of, of Buddha's previous uh, incarnations of the Bodhisattva. With the divine eye I saw beings passing away and being reborn, and I understood how beings fare on according to their actions thus. Mm. Karma. Consequences. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the middle watch of the night. This is suffering this is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. What do we call that? The four, the four noble truths. The four noble truths. There's suffering. And there's, it has to do with clinging and there's a way out of that. And that is the Eightfold Path. And this, this, these are the four noble truths. Presented. Now, I'm the style of the of, of, of the language is much more dense. Okay, so I'm not reading it all. I'm just picking out bits to make it a bit more easy to to uh, take on board. So this is, these are the four noble truths. So this his all his teachings he gets in this insight that we remember on Bodhi Day, Rahatsuk. So life itself is dukkha. Dukkha is suffering. So even when we're happy, it will pass. Even when, even when we're full of <coughs> joy and bliss. Even when we win the lotto. It might ruin our life. So 
everything will pass, including pain, including the hard times, the times where we're lonely and unhappy. But so will the times when we're joyous and fulfilled. The people we hate will prosper, the people we love will die. So, it's inescapable, dukkha. But with some kind of equanimity, we can suffer less. And really, while we have human form, while we're here in this life, we will suffer. So what the Buddha is often said to have taught was freedom from suffering. From suffering. But for us, it's freedom in suffering. It's a little different. So the Buddha teaches us freedom in our suffering. And when we die, we won't have the, this type of suffering anymore, where we our flesh. So freedom in suffering. So this this equanimity, this non-attachment, this non-attachment, I never like that phrase. It seems cold. It seems lacking heart. Equanimity. I like equanimity. There's a balance to it. Remember, Buddhism is often seen as nihilistic, mistakenly so, and slightly cold. But no, it's 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 got a very big heart, a loving heart. These teachings, this tradition, and we have to adequately communicate that and share that. My mind was liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed. The spiritual life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being. This was the th third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. I saw the ancient path, the ancient road, travelled by the perfectly enlightened ones of the past. And what is that ancient path, that ancient road? It is just this noble eightfold path. That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. The Eightfold Path. I considered this dharma that I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. But this population delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment. It is hard for such a population to see this truth. Those died in... Okay, so he goes on. But Shakyamuni then is not convinced in the beginning that he should share his insight, that people will understand what he's realised. Thankfully, he changes his mind and, and teaches. Goes forth and teach. That's why we're here two and a half thousand years later. So, and perhaps we will, we will remember this. The Eightfold Path, remember, <coughs> includes wisdom and samadhi and compassion. Well, we sit zazen, we practice mindfulness and concentration, samadhi. But that's only part of the Eightfold Path. Compassion, like livelihood, like speech. The precepts Amri's taking today, 
These are as important as sitting zazen. Wisdom and compassion together. Just wisdom is not enough. To be wise is not enough. One must also strive to be compassionate. We require both. And both make up this Eightfold Path. And so does right understanding from the very beginning. So, myself and David were talking about this yesterday. <coughs> that Zen is well known for being beyond words, beyond intellectual understanding. Does that mean we should reject it, throw, throw out intellectual understanding? Absolutely not. We study. We use our reason. We examine for ourselves. We don't take anyone's word for it. We feel the quality of what's been taught. And if we find it false, we reject it. If we find it true, we can take it on board. So, Rahatsu is a good time to return to the core teachings of Buddhism. The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Marks of Existence, that it's impermanent, that existence is impermanent. That gives it its beauty. I mean, that's why in Japan they celebrate the, the cherry blossom flowers in the spring, when the spring comes. They're so transient. If they were there all year, their beauty would be so much less. Interdependence. The fact that we are all part of this, this great Dharma body. This great ocean of being. And sunyata, so emptiness. That everything is made up of everything else. That nothing has its own intrinsic nature. What is this session? This session is Kevin handing out the candles at the stupa this morning. It is Neil ringing the bell. It is William and Des serving us. Every action, everything adds up to session. Total interconnection and total penetration. Not one thing can be removed or added. It is as it is. It is thusness. Thusness. You are perfect, just as you are. Now improve what you have, as Shikai said, Suzuki Roshi used to say. So, wisdom, compassion. These are the things that we will honor in our Bodhisattva ceremony today. Thank you so much for your practice. Okay. Oh, why not? There's a bell. <laughs> May the merits of these teachings penetrate into each thing in all places so that we and every sentient being together may realize the Buddha's way. All Buddhas throughout space
Maha Prajna Pah. 